Thank Please. you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. A few disclosures. I'm not an economist. I'm an ecologist. I'm not an academic. I'm a, a bridge builder, perhaps between research and action. And my views are tainted by 30 years of mostly unsuccessful effort to reverse the tide of environmental degradation that threatens our common home. I'm gonna start with a story, uh, my feeble attempt at a, a modern day parable. Augustus and have talked to us about the need to have some more powerful stories. But imagine for a moment, the earth is a business. Planet Earth Limited is an integrated global conglomerate providing products and services to customers all over the world. It's been in business a long time with such huge capital accounts that only recently in the wake of other business scandals have its owners decided to audit the books and examine just how well it's really doing. Now the audit reveals a company in deep trouble. Nearly three quarters of the company's 18 divisions examined are in the red and only four are profitable. The auditor's qualified opinion is sobering, pointing to the absence of internal controls, capital accounts undervalued and depleted for short-term gain, and extensive use of off-balance sheet assets and liabilities. In addition, the business units are pitted against each other with an inefficient economic transfer pricing mechanism. They're limited, there's no strategic planning, there's an underinvestment in R&D, and markets of distorted or zero values for planet Earth's assets. And there is no leadership to recognize the synergies between divisions. The company appears to be run without a CEO. And the auditor contends that to avoid future bankruptcy, the company's management must transform its practices or be replaced. So that's the story. Okay, but last year, uh, global, last year's global assessment report of the Intergovernment Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, what I call the IPCC for nature, can be compared to a business audit. Its 150 scientists found that of the 18 ecosystem services that they assessed globally, only four had been in, enhanced since 1970, and the rest were all degraded or depleted. So if there was a control board for nature, there would be 18 lights on it, four would be flashing green, and the other 14 would be flashing red. Laudato C makes the case that humans and nature are interconnected, of course. And if we destroy our common home, we will destroy ourselves. While our common home is under siege, we are sim simultaneously amid this great acceleration of humanity's environmental footprint and the great concentration of wealth. And as Maximo and others have noted, COVID-19 is exacerbating that gap between rich and poor. So what to do? So I would argue that the global market is both the problem and the solution. The global market system is designed to maximize profit while meeting people's needs. And clearly it's doing better for some than others. But to be fair, it has had some success. As economic historian Deirdre McCloskey noted, Western Europe's embrace the profit motive was the catalyst for what she, what she dubbed the great enrichment of the last two centuries. In this period, the world had seen unprecedented improvement in living standards, enhanced individual freedoms. Good. But today's market has also become the single most environmentally destructive force on the planet. It's the elephant in the Garden of Eden. And by 2050, it's probably going to be at least twice as big. So we need to harness its unmatched capital and ingenuity from being a destructive to a restorative force of the planet. We need to learn what moves it. Now, as I said, I'm not an economist, but I figured out it's not that complex. It pursues profits. Now, CEOs may make nice speeches. They might sign on to nice declarations and embrace nice values. But if they don't continually increase profits, not just keep create profits, but increase profits, they lose their jobs. Now, fortunately, business is pragmatic about how it makes profits. It's willing to change locations, products, technologies, inputs, if this leads to increased profitability. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm losing my place here. Sorry. 
I'm come here now. We therefore need to ensure, and this is a key point here, the rules of the game incentivize stewardship of our common home and its occupants, especially the most vulnerable. Now, of course, you've all said that, and it's easier said than done, okay? But it still must be done because we don't have time to invent a new system. So I'm gonna focus on two actions that I think will help achieve this. And government is central to both, but citizens and businesses must also be the driving force. So first, <clears throat> fix the calculation of corporate profit. I don't think the pursuit of profit is the primary problem. It's a problem, but it's not the primary problem. The problem is that the incompleteness of the profit calculation, including the value of all the things we've been talking about, the clean air, water, healthy ecosystems, and what happens to poor people, especially when they're degraded. Now, these emissions might have been less significant about a century ago when we had an abundance of resources. But today, as we approach the limits of the planet, um, uh, it's not the case. And it's now interesting to go back to that analogy that I talked about of, of planet Earth and the intergovernment panel's results. The very four divisions that the intergovernment platform found had increased are food, fish, bioenergy, and uh, harvested materials. They all actually have a price in the marketplace. And by the way, they've been increased in ways that aren't gonna be sustainable over the long run. But the other 14 divisions, ecosystem services, are mostly have no price in this marketplace. So financial accounting owns its integrity to the double, book, double entry booking. But when it comes to the environment, we typically practice single entry booking. We record the value of what we harvest from nature but make no matching entry for its depletion or degradation. You know, food companies, I work a lot with food companies. They don't account for soil erosion or water pollution or the climate change effects of, of forest conversion. Not yet, until they actually turn up to be a cost when it's too, time, too, too late to do something. Now, some argue against putting a value on nature. It's too difficult. You know, Helen talked about, I loved what Helen said about, you know, the most, most important things can't be counted, but what we don't count doesn't get counted here either. And um, while that invisible hand of markets may have some powers, I've been told, to manage scarcity, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. So governments must ensure that the true cost of the environment is factored into the corporate profit calculations. This is equally true of their own national economic accounts too. And when needed, they should resort to the old fashioned non-market mechanisms to ensure certain destructive behaviors are off limits. Now, not with, notwithstanding Jeff's rightful cautions about property law, I would say property law is in case, a point we've learned that the hard way over the years that we need to constrain ourselves from taking the things of others. And the same is true for actions that destroy our common home. But again, easier said than done, which brings me to my second needed action um, for governments, which I think will help with the one I've just talked about. And that is we have to reduce corporate influence over public policy and elections. And since the 1970s, corporate influence over policymaking has grown by a multiple number of metrics I, I won't, won't go into here. Um, and the world's five largest publicly owned oil and gas companies spend around 200 billion and two, sorry 200 million annually lobbying against climate policy the same companies whose same CEOs showed up at the Vatican and made pledges uh, to implement the Paris agreement it should therefore be no surprise to us that the G20 countries that pledged to pledge 207 billion to support fossil fuels in their covid stimulus measures compared to just 130 137 billion for clean energy and much of that had no conditionalities, not even that employee, employees would keep their jobs. So governments must grasp, especially the US, the nestle, the nettle of corporate capture. We ought to have any hope of passing policies to protect our common home. They must reduce their power, business holds over them, while simultaneously providing citizens with a greater voice. To use Maximo's, Maximo's expression yesterday, we need partnerships sorry, to Mariana's uh, expression yesterday, we need partnerships between governments and business and society that are symbiotic, not parasitic. I just want to talk briefly about the self-greening of markets, you know, the ESG movement and all of that stuff, because I spent a lot of time in my career working in this area. So it's nice, but it's not suffice. So let me say a few words here. Um, the uh, business community 
will push back against great, greater government oversight and diminish, diminished influence. They will say, leave it to the markets. They may point to the fact that a thousand plus companies now have committed to science-based targets for climate. All the emerging promise of a circular economy. IKEA just announced recently that you know, it's gonna capture some of the resale, recycling of its furniture, because they realize that actually the sales market for a reused IKEA furniture is bigger than what they sell in the store. So that's good, okay? They might talk about the fact that a quarter of global financial assets are now managed sustainably in some form or ever. Of course, that depends on your definition of sustainability. So while these initiatives are important and full disclosure, WRI is involved in all of them, they aren't the end game. In my view, they are the wobbly stepping stones that need to be reinforced by strong government action if we are to address ecological limits in the limited time window that we have left. Now, in the early 1990s, John Alkinton coined the term triple bottom line to inspire business to give equivalence to the value of environmental, social, and economic factors. And since then, and I've been involved in this too, thousands of companies have produced these sustainability reports. But the thing is that these non-financial numbers, they don't count where it matters most against the bottom line. So it should therefore be no surprise that on the 25th anniversary of the triple bottom line concept, John Alkinton, to his credit, issued a product recall for that concept. Absence the next step of strong government action, it failed to achieve its goal of systems change. So um, it's time for governments to get back in the seat of governing. Now, sitting in Washington, D.C., in the age of Trump, it might seem like I'm bordering on insanity to be calling for more government oversight. But that's exactly what I think is needed to fix our global market system. If governments set rules of the game that factor the value of nature into profit calculation, it will help align profit making with solving the crisis of our common. And that elephant, instead of being rampant in the Garden of Eden, might actually turn its attention to tending to the garden while making a profit. Now, some leaders, even in the US, are coming around to this idea. In September, uh, 200 leading CEOs of the US Business Roundtable issued a statement calling for government-led action on climate change. The stirring of uh, business must be marked, matched by citizens' engagement, demanding action from both policymakers and as business. And I see it as part of my job at WRI to provide citizens with the information to hold governments and business accountable. I always think at WRI, we make the stones for others to throw. We don't throw them ourselves. But there's a lot of responsibility that comes with designing those stones so they hit the right target and don't have collateral damage. And if business and citizens prevail upon governments to get back into the business of governing, maybe we will see the passing of policies that actually match the scale of the global environmental challenge. So the homework question was, could the COVID pandemic be a catalyst for transforming markets? Let me just briefly end on that. Perhaps, but most likely not in my view. However, let's share four rays of hope. I don't wanna be completely pessimistic here. Four rays of hope from, from, the, from this terrible pandemic. First, as Joseph noted yesterday, it's not an equal opportunity virus. And the, that's a terrible thing. But the good thing that's come out of that, I hope, is it shall shine a public spotlight on this massive inequity and fraying of social safeguards. It's put that on the agenda. It wasn't there as, at the high as it needed to be. Number two, it's highlighted the critical role of governments, again, in this case, securing the markets. And while their performance in designing the recovery package was less than stellar, one hopes that the lessons will be learned because I am I am absolutely convinced there will be a next time, there will be a next run. So let's make sure that happens, the lessons are learned. And third, it highlights the behavior, it highlights that behavior can rapidly shift. You know, Christoph talks about this in ways that are positive. Um, but the challenge is how to lock those in and also make the needed technologies that underpin them freely and broadly available to all, not just the rich. And lastly, it serves as a reminder that prevention is better than cure. So um, I had a cartoon I was gonna show. If I have time, I will show it. If not, I will end here. So just let me know. 
Um, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, share screen. Okay, one more. Sorry, but your your time is finished. Okay, good. You don't have more time. Sorry, because we need. Good. Thank you. I'm done. We have time for. Thank you very much. Maybe you send this, and we can send to all people. Thank you very much.